Welcome back to another study in the book of Revelation. I'm Clyde Moyer. I'm the associate pastor here at Clifford Baptist Church. I appreciate you tuning in and I hope you get something out of it. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we jump back into our lesson. Father God, thank you so much for anyone that may tune in. Lord, bless them, whatever their situation, whatever their uh, country is like where they are, Father, whether it's here in the United States or somewhere else. I ask, Father, that you would bless people as they seek your word. Lord, you promised that if we read the book of Revelation that it was a book with blessing, that we would be blessed just from reading it. Father, as we study it, I ask that you would touch the people that tune in and myself as well. Guide me as I try to explain what you said, Father, and we'll trust you to do that and we'll give all the praise and glory to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Again, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're starting chapter four this time. Uh, we've seen the history of the church in the seven churches of chapters two and three, but from chapter four through the rest of the book of Revelation, there's no mention of the church except when you get to the very end of where the, of the end of Revelation. Um, it has gone off the air, so to speak, um, because it went up into the air uh, it was caught up to meet the Lord in the air in, a rap in the rapture. The rapture actually takes place during the Philadelphian period, and the so-called church which continues on the earth is nothing but an organization. It will go through the Great Tribulation, and we're finally going to hear it called the Great Harlot. Now, that's a terrible thing for the church to be called, but that is what has become of the church with only the apostate members left. Uh, chapters 4 through 22 make up the final major division of this very wonderful book. John was given the division of this book and he passed it on to us. He said in chapter 1, verse 19, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Uh, the shall be hereafter, that's metatata, meaning after these things. A metatauta is the Greek for after these things. Uh, several striking facts make itself, make itself evident that we advance to a new division beginning with chapter 4. Number one, the climate and conditions are very, very different than chapters 1 through 3. The first point is the church is no longer seen in the world. Clearly something has happened radically for the church not to be mentioned at all until it comes back with Christ. And, of course, the easy explanation and obvious explanation is that it has been raptured out to go and be with the Lord. Point two, the scene definitely shifts to heaven in chapter four. Before, we've been looking at what was here on the ground. Jesus is given sending letters to the seven, seven literal churches to tell them what they need to do to get better, what they need to do to repent. And each of those seven churches, as J. Vernon McGee has said before, represents an age of time. Since the church is still the subject, though, we follow it now to its new home of heaven. Uh, point three, the church is not a name, but a definition of those who have trusted Christ in this age. The church is not a building, it's not a country, it's not a nationality. The church is every single human being that has accepted Christ as their, as their Savior and are born again. We are one body with one, one Bible, one word, one spirit, and one Lord. Uh, it doesn't matter what country we're from. If we're Christians, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we should love each other. And at this point, we're with the Lord in heaven. Point four, the judgments beginning at chapter six would not be in harmony with the gracious provision that, and promise that God made to the church about taking care of it. If the church remained in the world, it would frustrate the grace of God because he promised to deliver us from judgment. We're still here. We weren't delivered. Therefore, it clearly is gone. Uh, point five. Finally, to continue from chapter three to chapter four without recognizing the break is to ignore the normal and natural division in the book as stated in chapter one, verse 19. Uh, as we begin to enter this last division of the book with its judgment and wrath, it would be good for us to keep our perspective that Jesus Christ is central in this part of the book completely. After these things, in other words, after the ch church things have concluded, 
the scene shifts to heaven. Uh, this is a very radical change. However, the word of God describes personages and activities in heaven as normally as it described them on earth. Only the Holy Spirit could take things of heaven and make them clear to us people still on earth. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the great teacher, and he is, a, is wonderful at opening our eyes and hearts to see things that we need to see. The church is not seen under the familiar name it had in the world, but is now seen as the priesthood of believers with the great high priest. We are now with Christ. Uh, Christ is viewed here in his threefold office, and his threefold office, office is prophet, priest, and king. He is worshipped as God because he is God. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 4 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first door which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. After these things, that's metatata again, is used twice here. It both opens and closes the verse. Uh, I think J. Vernon McGee is spot on when he says that suggests that he thinks it's used twice to emphasize what's being said. I saw. Uh, the words I saw are, are the eye gate, and I heard is the ear gate. Uh, John is seeing and hearing. I saw, and behold, a door set open in heaven. This is one of four open doors mentioned in the book of Revelation. Now, the first door is in chapter 3, verse 8, speaking to the church at Philadelphia, when the Lord says, I have set before thee an open door. The second door is the open door of invitation and identification with Christ. It's in chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, this is a very, very familiar verse and one of my favorites. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. That door is the door to your heart. And if you've ever seen the famous picture of it, the handle is on the inside. You must open it and invite Christ in. Uh, now, point three, we have an open door here in verse one, which is the way to God through Christ. And then point four, in chapter 19, verse 11, we see a door opened in heaven again. That is the open door through which Christ will come at his second coming when he's heading back this way. He comes out at the end of the great tribulation to put down all of the unrighteousness and all the rebellion against God and to establish his kingdom. John didn't see this door opening as the authorized version of verse 1 suggests. The authorized version would be King James Version. Uh, this door was open all the time. It's the door through which believers have come to God for over 1900 years when we accept Christ and believe. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that's Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6. John also said, I am the door. By me, if, or rather Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. That's found in John 10, 9. So John, is in his Gospel, relates two different verses where Jesus is saying, you're coming in through me. The open door to heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's also the one who comes to the door of your heart, and that is an amazing thing that he loves us and wants us to be saved and to come and be with him. We enter by faith. That's the only way to go in. In modern terminology, we might express it like this. Faith puts us on the launching pad of the church, which is Christ, and at the rapture, we go through this door like a guided missile. We're shot right through the door. Uh, come up hither, is heaven's invitation to John. And the cool thing is, is it's an invitation to all the fellowship that know Christ as Savior. Our time will come. John wrote in 1 John 1, 3, that which ye have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. John, in effect, is saying we heard it, we saw it, and now we're telling you what we heard and saw. I'm letting you know this so you can have fellowship also. And one of these days you'll be going up through that same open door. The Apostle John is comforting us and encouraging us and saying this will happen to us. Our time will come. We should wait patiently. 
Uh, and the first voice which I heard, a voice as of a trumpet speaking with me. Now this is the sound which calls the church to meet Christ in the air. And whose voice is it? It's the voice of Jesus Christ. And it is so magnificent that it sounds like a trumpet. In the New Testament, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, God's word says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. When anyone tells you that the word rapture is not in the Bible, remember that the Greek word for caught up is harpazo. That's H-A-R-P-A-Z-O. It means caught up, raptured, or snatched up. Uh, come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must come to pass after these things. After what things? After the church has completed its earthly run and is caught up. Verse 2 says this, and immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Sat on the throne. At once means straight away. It's referring to how quickly this happens. It's, it's one of the characteristics of the rapture. Uh, Paul said that we are to be caught up in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And actually, uh, it's that twinkling of an eye has been measured and it's estimated to be approximately one thousand one one thousandth of a second. Now that's moving on pretty good. Uh, I found myself in the Spirit, uh, John says. In other words, the Holy Spirit is still guiding John into new truth and showing him things to come. And John also says, And behold, a throne is set in heaven and one sitting on the throne. The throne was already there. But John now, John now sees it for the first time. Uh, our attention is now directed to the center of attraction. Uh, the throne represents the universal sovereignty and rulership of God. A throne of grace now becomes a throne of judgment. While Jesus was on earth, he was not judging people. And in fact, he said so. You remember the woman that, he, uh, that was caught in adultery. And he said, neither do I judge you. Go and sin no more. But now that he's in heaven, the next time the world at large sees him, he will be their judge. Uh, this is another reason that I say very definitely that the church has now left the world when this takes place. Because if the church were still on the earth, when Christ has left the place of intercession and has come to the place of judgment, he's in the wrong place for the church. Verse 3 of chapter 4 says, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. All that we see here is color, beautiful color like precious stones. We don't really get a picture of God as all, at all. Uh, quite frankly, and this is a, a kind of a hard to describe point, but I don't think we will ever see God the Father. God the Father is spirit. Uh, we're told that if we've seen Christ, we've seen the Father. And this, this involves the Trinity, which, as we have mentioned before, is a very difficult concept to really get your mind wrapped around. Briefly, uh, let's talk about it just for a minute. Um, we have one God that has three persons. And uh, some of the, the criti critics of Christianity say, no, if you have the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you're worshiping three different gods. But that's not what God the Father says. He says that the three are one. Uh, one of the best, uh, <coughs> excuse me, one of the best descriptions of that that I've come across is one, across is one my wife uses with her preschoolers. When she teaches Sunday school, she will bring in a pizza and ask the children, how many pizzas do I have? And they will say one. And then she'll cut the pizza into three equal pieces. And she says, how many pieces do I have? And they'll say three. And she says, but how many pizzas do I have? And they will repeat again, one. And she uses that to explain the concept of three and one. I think that is about as good a description as you can come up with. Another description that has been used is using an egg. The shell, the yolk, and the white. Three things, one egg. 
Uh, each of the individual parts has its own job to do, its own characteristics, but the three are still one egg or one pizza. Uh, I suspect that's about as close as I'm going to be able to come to talking about the Trinity. Uh, anyway, let's go back to verse 3. I'm going to reread verse 3. <clears throat> And he that sat up was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Uh, our direction <coughs> is directed directly to the one who is seated on the throne, and although he is God the Father, we should understand this to be the throne of the triune God, <coughs> all three. Nevertheless, the three persons of the Trinity are distinguished, one, God the Holy Spirit in verses 2 and 5, 2, God the Father here in verse 3, and 3, God the Son in verse 5 of chapter 5. And he that sat upon it was to look lo look upon like a jasper. Now, I really didn't have the color right when I started checking into what a jasper looked like. The jasper stone, number one, is the least is the last stone identified in the breastplate of the high priest. But it was the first stone in the foundation of the New Jerusalem, and also the first seen in the wall of the New Jerusalem. It was a many-colored stone with purple predominating, and I believe I'm correct, correct in saying that purple is considered a royal color. Um, some identify it, uh, some scholars identify the jasper stone with a diamond. Now, I'm not sure how you consider a, a, a stone that is predominantly purple a diamond, but they must have some reason. So there's some disagreement as to what it actually looks like. But it was in the breastplate of the high priest of Israel representing little Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, whom Jacob called the son of my right hand. Uh, perhaps this speaks of Christ as he ascended and took his place at the right hand of the Father. Uh, the sardine stone is the sixth stone in the foundation of, the, of New Jerusalem. And in color, it was a fiery red. Again, I would not have picked red to go along with the word sardine. The sardine stone was the first stone in the breastplate of the high priest, and it represented the tribe of Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob. And Christ is the son of God, the firstborn from the dead. Rainbow is the Greek word iris, which can also mean halo. While the rainbow is polychrome, here it is emerald, which is green. Uh, J. Vernon suspects, and I, I don't disagree with him at all, that God may have at this color the rainbow shown here because of the fact he had destroyed the earth once with a flood, and he had promised that it would never be destroyed by flood again, and God always keeps his word. That being the case, this rainbow here around the throne is a reminder that he will not destroy it by a flood again. Uh, green is the color of the earth. The suggestion here is that the prophet Habakkuk, uh, it's verses, verse three, chapter three, verse two in Habakkuk, in wrath, remember mercy. And we're going to close with that thought. In wrath, remember mercy. And God will do that. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the folks that tune in. Please remove me from any of the study, Lord. Let only your truth be heard. Correct me if I need correction. Bless them and protect their minds that they hear you speaking to them and not me. In Christ's precious name I pray, amen. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you next week.